All right, chapter one, section two, Euler's fee function. In modular arithmetic, it will be important to know when, given a and b, the equation a times x equals b mod n has a solution. All right, so it'll be important to know when that equation has a solution. For example, there is exactly one solution to the equation 7x equals 3 mod 143. But there are no solutions to the equation 11x equals 3 mod 143. However, there are 11 solutions to the equation 11x equals 22 mod 143. Luckily, it is very easy to test when such an equation has one, many, or no solutions. We simply compute the greatest common divisor, or GCD, of A, that's the lowercase a, and N. Okay, so they're doing the greatest common divisor of the coefficient of x and the mod. So, i.e., GCD a comma n. If G, the GCD of a and n is 1, uh, greatest common divisor of a and n is 1, then there is exactly one solution. We find the value c such that a times c equals 1 mod n. And then we compare, then we compute x equals b times c mod n. If g equals the greatest common divisor of a and n, is not equal to 1, and the GCD of A and N divides B, the greater, greatest common divisor of A and N, then there are G solutions, where G is the greatest common divisor of A and N. That's the number of solutions. Here we divide the whole equation by g to produce the equation a prime times x prime equals b prime mod n prime, where a prime is a divided by g and b prime is b divided by g. Oh, because they have a greatest common divisor, you can do that. And n prime equals n divided by g. Uh, let's see, the greatest common divisor of a and n, a and n, so, oh, I see. So it says here that also the greatest common divisor divides b. Then there are g solutions. That's why you can divide b over here. If x prime is a solution to the above equation, then x equals x prime plus i n prime. x equals x prime plus i n prime. I wonder, this is something like the division algorithm. For 0 less than or equal to i less than g, is a solution of the original one. Otherwise, there are no solutions. Let's see, the greatest common divisor is 1. The greatest common divisor is different 1 and divides b. Oh, and if, apparently, if it doesn't divide b, then there are no solutions. The case where the greatest common divisor of a and n is 1 is so important we have a special name for it. We say a and n are relatively prime or co-prime. 
The number of integers in z mod nz, which are relatively prime to n, is given by the Euler phi function, phi of n. So let's see, whatever number n is, phi of n tells how many integers are relatively prime to it. Given the prime factorization of n, it is easy to compute the value of phi of n. If n has the prime factorization, then n can be written, now this is a capital pi symbol and it means to multiply. So um, you're multiplying over the indices, the i is the index, from 1 to n. n, what is that, e sub i? So it'll be p1 e to the 1 times p2 e sub 2. Uh, so it's the different primes with their different exponents. So that's just the prime, fa the fact that you can factor any uh, number n into a uh, prime factorization. This is a fancy way of writing that. So then phi of n, um, the phi function of n is the product i equals 1 to n p sub i e sub i minus 1 times p sub i minus 1. Uh, hmm. Note the last statement, it is very important for cryptography. I think he means is very important. So this should probably read, the last statement is very important for, for cryptography. Given the factorization of n, it is easy to compute the value of phi of n. The most important cases for the value of phi of n in cryptography are 1. If p is prime, then phi of p equals p minus 1. Oh, those are the numbers relatively prime to it. If p and so right so the, of course there's p minus one numbers relatively prime to the uh, prime number p, like uh, if you have the number three. Right. Anyway, number two. If p and q are both prime and p is different from q, then phi of the product of p and q is p minus one times q minus one. So the number, uh, the numbers relatively prime to p times q is p minus 1 times q minus 1. Okay, so that's the Euler phi function. And this probably, the key thing here is the number of integers in z mod nz, which are relatively prime to n, is given by the Euler phi function of n. Okay, 1.3, multiplicative inverse modulo n. We have just seen that when we wish to solve equations of the form ax equals b mod n, we reduce to the equation of examining when an integer a modulo n has a multiplicative inverse i.e. whether there is a number c such that a times c equals c times a equals 1 mod n. We reduce the question of examining when an inter integer a modulo n has a multiplicative inverse Oh, sure, right, a multiplicative inverse is when a number multiplies to give the identity. <laughs> Such a value of c is often written a to the minus 1. Sure. Clearly, a to the minus 1 is the solution to the equation ax equals 1 mod n. Hence, the inverse of a only exists when a and n are co-prime. 
i.e. the greatest common divisor of a and n equals 1. Of particular interest is when n is a prime p. Since then for all non-zero values of a in z mod pz, we always obtain a unique solution to ax equals 1 mod p. Uh, so in this case, p is a prime, z mod pz. So n is a prime p. So the mod is a prime. Then we always obtain a unique solution to ax equals 1. So everything has unique inverse. Hence, if p is a prime, then every non-zero element in z mod pc, pz, z mod pz has a multiplicative inverse. A ring like z mod pz with this property is called a field. Definition 1.3, fields. A field is a set with two operations, g, that's the set, dot, the multiplication, plus addition, such that the set G under addition is an abelian group with identity denoted by zero. The set G with zero taken out of it under multiplication is an abelian group. And the set G under the two operations, in this case written like multiplication and addition, satisfies the distributive distributive law. Hence, a field is a commutative ring for which every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. Okay, so uh, field is a commutative ring where the non-zero elements have a multiplicative inverse. So you see groups, rings, fields are all interconnected here. You have met fields before. For example, consider the infinite fields of rational, real, or complex numbers. We define the set of all invertible elements in z mod nz by z mod nz with a star in the exponent. Okay, so that's the set of all x in z mod nz such that the greatest common divisor of x and n is 1. The star in a to the star for any ring a refers to the largest subset of a which forms a group under multiplication. Hence the set z mod nz with a star in the exponent Right, the set of all invertible elements in z mod nz is a group with respect to multiplication and it has size phi of n. There's the phi function. In the special case when n is a prime p, we have z mod pz star equals 1 dot 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 up to p minus 1. Oh sure, if it's a prime, all the stuff in there is relatively prime to the prime number, n is prime, and so that's in the set of z mod n z star. Okay, since every non-zero element of z mod p z is co-prime to p, for an arbitrary field f, the set f star is equal to the set f minus the number 0. That's the non-zero elements. So basically it's everything in the field except the 0. To ease notation for this very important case, define f sub p the field with respect to a prime p. Okay, so f sub p equal to z mod pz. 
which is 0 up to p minus 1. And f star uh, sub p um, equals z mod p z star e equals the numbers 1 up to p minus 1. Notice f sub p would have 0, 1, dot, 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 p minus 1. But f sub p star, which is z mod p z star, would, have the, would leave out 0 and start at 1 and go up to p minus 1. The set f sub p is a finite field of characteristic p. In the next section, we shall discuss a more general type of finite field. But for now, recall the important point that the integers modulo n are only a field when n is prime. We end this section with the most important theorem in elementary group theory. Hmm, Lagrange's theorem. Theorem 1.4, Lagrange's theorem. If g under multiplication is a group of order size n equals um, hash g or pound g, Oh, that's the number, the order of G, probably. Okay, the number of elements in G. Okay, so if G under multiplication is a group of order, size N, where there's the number sign G would be the number of elements in there, then for all A in G, we have A to the N equals 1. In other words, if you raise every element to the order of the group, it's going to uh, the pa that power multiplied that many times, then that will equal the identity element in the group. So if x is in z mod n z star, then x to the phi of n equals one mod n. Since the order of z mod n z star equals phi of n. This leads us to Fermat's little theorem, not to be confused with Fermat's last theorem, which is something entirely different. Theorem 1.5, Fermat's little theorem. Suppose P is a prime and A is an element of the integer Z. That's what this Z stands for, the integers. Then A to the P equals A mod P. So a raised to a prime number p uh, is equal to itself mod p. Fermat's little theorem is a special case of Lagrange's theorem and will form the basis of one of the primality tests considered in a later chapter. Notice the theorems 1.4 is called Lagrange's theorem and theorem 1.5 for Ma's little theorem. So if they have a name, they probably important and they'll get used over and over and over again. So which means you should probably know them.